once upon a time, there was a magical land where fairy tales were brought to life. That land, whose entrance is proudly guarded by Le Chateau de la Belle au Bois Dormant, is the place we all now know as Fantasyland. Inspired by the great Disney classics, this magical kingdom also pays tribute to the various European countries which our favorite childhood fairy tales hail. Let's head off on a trip around Disneyland Paris, exploring them together. Fantasyland is the place where the magical series of our childhood come to life. Most of the great Disney classics come from European fairy tales. When opening the first theme park in Europe, Imagineers decided to pay tribute not only to the Disney classics, but also to the fairy tales that inspired them. Keen to capture Europe's architectural flavor when creating the magical world of Fantasyland, the park's designers drew on the techniques employed by animators at the Disney Studios. Curvaceous lines here, exaggerated proportions here, all combined with just enough traditional details to keep one foot firmly in the real world. Sleeping Beauty Castle, La Confiserie des Trois Fées, and Auberge pay tribute to France. The Great Britain region goes from Peter Pan's flight to Mad Hatter's teacups. The Italian part is represented by Pizzeria Bella Note. The German section spans from the shop of the Seven Dwarfs to Chalet de Marionette. Finally, the international area includes Storybook Ride, Princess Pavilion, and it's a small world. Stretching out beyond Le Chateau de la Belle au Bois Dormant, the castle courtyard is, indeed, evocative of medieval France. Le Carousel de Lancelot takes pride of place in the very heart of the courtyard. Its noble steeds, their manes and tails emblazoned with gold leaf, patiently awaiting their modern-day knights and damsels. Displaying a Renaissance style, so typical of the Loire Valley's chateaux and mansions, L'Auberge de Cendrillon, meanwhile, is a homage to Charles Perrault's fairy tale, Cinderella. Once you step inside, a selection of stunning tapestries crafted at the Royal Factory in Aubusson will immerse you headlong into the world of the glass-slippered princess. The scenes from the storybook ride can also be seen from Casey Jr. But if you choose to travel by boat, you'll see that the vessels are named after female Disney characters only.
Now, it's time to make our way to the northern part of Fantasyland, or more specially to Great Britain, with its flower-filled gardens, babbling brooks, and quaint little cottages. Featuring over 360 meters of shrubs, Alice's curious labyrinth instantly conjures up images of the European tradition for hedge mazes, such as Britain's biggest located in Longleat. For the very first full-length feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Walt Disney drew inspiration from a German fairy tale by the Grimm brothers. The shop and attraction, which follow the theme of this 1937 classic, are situated in typical German buildings. We've made sure to include troubling elements to indicate that the experience could overwhelm younger visitors. However, if you pay special attention, this small axe is a sign that our friends, the Seven Dwarfs, aren't too far off. The German region is also home to a character whose name and origins are clearly Italian, Pinocchio. That's right, even if his story was written by Carlo Collodi in Italy, the Disney Studios adapted it in 1940s. Look at how he is dressed. He is clearly Tyrolean. That's why the attraction, shop, and restaurant inspired by Pinocchio are in the German, not Italian part of Fantasyland. Every, every morning you ride Pinocchio? Every yeah? morning I, At this straight, last five I go through the dragon, I go up to the castle, and I come here. We find ourselves stepping into the heart of British countryside and admiring the Toad Hall restaurant a charming little red brick manor house. Once through the doors, this restaurant oozes an overtly British style, from its rustic decor right down to the fare that features on the menu, traditional fish and chips. Scotland is now just a stone's throw away with Peter Pan's flight. In the queuing area, you may well spot a metal gate emblazoned with the name Kirimur, which is a nod to the birthplace of James Matthew Barry, the author of Peter Pan. What's really interesting about Peter Pan is that the black light technique is being used, which is really a long-standing tradition uh, for Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. You, you create illusion and, and, and a lot of depth um, with painting and black light. That's really the magic of black light. So when you, when you have an attraction like Peter Pan, it really helps the guests feel like they're immersed in that situation um, with a lot of depth of space. Like when you fly over London, it's really beautiful with a lot of depth, which you could not create under normal lighting circumstances, but are very effective in black light. This rehab has really been interesting for me because it's been a nice collaboration between Disneyland Paris painters and also Walt Disney World painters from Florida. I myself am here from California. To see everyone's talents come together um, and work in harmony to, to get the desired result has really been a, probably the most fun in this rehab. It's been a really, really good team, a very uh, good amount of very talented people. If you're dying to explore Italy, however, you simply need to make a beeline for the other side of Fantasyland, where Pizzeria Bella Notte awaits you. Note how the building's facade stands at a somewhat jaunty angle, reminiscent of a certain tower in Pisa. Our journey continues indoors, surrounded by a plethora of decorative details evoking Venice and Tuscany in turn, all peppered with references to the great Disney classic, Lady and the Tramp. The most iconic reference of all, however, is found on the restaurant's menu. Spaghetti with meatballs to be devoured as a family, with friends, or during a romantic tete-a-tete. Our 
ultimate destination is the Netherlands, with the old mill nestled alongside the navigable waterways of storybook land, paying a subtle tribute to the country. The next stop on our European tour is It's a Small World, whose stylized facade showcases some of the world's best-known monuments, including Europe's Eiffel Tower and Big Ben, of course. Once you've made yourself comfortable in your boat, the happiest cruise that ever sailed serves up a fresh look at the European continent before whisking you off over mountains and seas to explore new horizons. One trip always leads to another. Located in the heart of Fantasyland, not far from Peter Pan's flight and Mad Hatter's teacups, Dumbo the Flying Elephant offers every visitor the opportunity to take part in an astonishing circus act inspired by the film. The attraction looks like a huge mechanical toy equipped with 16 Dumbo-shaped vehicles. When Timothy raises his magic feather, the show begins, Dumbo start to turn counterclockwise while their pilots can climb into the air and change altitude using a lever. They can shave the circular basin that surrounds the central structure or fly more than five meters above the ground and enjoy a breathtaking view of Fantasyland. But the magic also works for the spectators. The colors of the costumes of the various elephants have been distributed so that they are linked together gradually and in the order of the colors of the rainbow. A real spectacle for the eyes. As for the ears of the visitors, they are also at the party with an anthology of circus marches arranged for fanfare, including the famous Entrance of Gladiators Julius Fuchik, 1903-1943, which had in its time inspired some arrangements of the original film. The story behind the popular It's a Small World Fantasyland attraction started with the 1964 to 1965 New York World's Fair. Walt Disney Imagineering was set to work on three pavilions. Thanks to these three pavilions, new technology was produced and is still used nowadays. Take for instance the technique for vehicles in perpetual motion, now used in the famous doom buggies of Phantom Manor. This technology dates back to the 60s, has since been improved upon, and can even be found in recent attractions such as Buzz Lightyear Laser Blast. Another technology developed for the World's Fair and used in Pirates of the Caribbean is the human audio animatronics characters. And if these three pavilions weren't enough, less than a year before the World's Fair opening, Walt Disney took on a fourth pavilion in order to raise money for UNICEF. The decision was made to create a story featuring children from across the world. As time was of the essence, the sets were made to look like children's cutout drawings. That is why they are two-dimensional in all the scenes. Taking inspiration from a section in The Three Caballeros, from 1944, children were depicted as dolls that all had the same face but differed in their intricately made costumes and hairstyles, which paid tribute to their various countries of origin. In the original concept, each doll was to sing its own national anthem. It was mayhem. Walt decided to go back to the studio and asked his composers to come up with something new. You already know who we're talking about. Brothers Richard and Robert Sherman. The most obvious Disney reference, Richard and Robert Sherman, composers behind favorite Disney classics like Mary Poppins, 1964, Jungle Book, 1967, and It's a Small World. Walt's instructions were simple. The song must be easily memorized. I think we can all agree that mission accomplished. The song was so popular that they got scared people would stop in front of each scene. They therefore had to think of a way to get visitors to go from one to the next without realizing it. This is where the idea for boats came from. They drew inspiration from an attraction that was already at Disneyland, Storybook Land Canal Boats. This attraction was also used as inspiration for Le Pays des Contes de Fées at Disneyland Paris.
Also, the use of singing audio animatronics characters in boats later went on to be part of the concept for Pirates of the Caribbean, which opened in 1967. It's a Small World was such a success that at the end of the World's Fair, the content of the pavilion was taken to Disneyland in California to become the attraction we now all know. One of the specificities of the Disneyland Paris version is that the Disneyland railroad tracks travel through its facade, which is more than 270 meters wide. Finally, even if cast members wear gondolier costumes, they should be considered more as ambassadors who enable visitors to go back to childhood aboard the happiest cruise that ever sailed, just as Walt Disney had imagined. root of the storybook ride lies Walt Disney's passion for miniatures. Since his childhood, he was fascinated by fairy tales and other fantasy stories such as Jack and the Beanstalk, Alice in Wonderland, and Gulliver's Travels. He particularly enjoyed seeing characters in disproportionately large environments, and this was evident early on in his work. It is said that his first experience of scale models dates back to the early 1930s, when he helped his nephew, a certain Roy E. Disney, to build his electric train. But it was in 1939 that he really developed a passion for these tiny objects, discovering the impressive collection of Narcissa Thorne, an American artist famous for her 1 12th scale recreations of American, European, and Asian interiors, at the Golden Gate International Exhibition, which opened in San Francisco that year. He began to collect all sorts of miniatures, acquired in particular during his travels throughout Europe including furniture, tableware, books, and musical instruments. He even tried his hand at building scale models, which proved quite successful. He started out with simple objects and worked his way up from there. The attraction, which opened in 1994, also recaptures Walt's original idea of playing with scale in a highly imaginative manner. The entrance sequence, with its giant book representing Happy Valley from Fun and Fancy Free, 1947, and its plants evoking a patchwork quilt, as can also be seen in California, in homage to the silly symphony lullaby land from 1933, gives guests the impression of falling back into childhood, as if reading a story before going to sleep. The other special feature of this version is the organization of the scenes, which echoes that of Fantasyland, set out in areas dedicated to each European country, while extending it to the tales and stories from all over the world that inspired Walt Disney Animation Studios. This choice also recalls Walt's original project involving a miniature cruise around the world. The boats that sail these peaceful canals bear the names of female Disney characters, such as Wendy, Jasmine, Pocahontas, Aurora, and Mary Poppins. Just like the original ride in California, the Paris attraction has evolved over time, opening without any characters, as is still the case today in the United States, before later becoming populated with iconic figures for each scene. In 2010, Rapunzel's tower was modified to reflect the exact design of the tower in the animated film Tangled released the same year. This year, to mark the attraction's 30th anniversary, three new scenes have been added, inspired by the Disney animated films Frozen, Winnie the Pooh, and the Pixar animated film Up. During their peaceful boat ride, guests can now admire a number of new scenes, including majestic North Mountain overlooked by Elsa's iconic Ice Palace, Winnie the Pooh's treehouse, and Carl Fredrickson's house flying above Paradise Falls, which serves as the final scene. This final scene feels like a parting invitation to travel. Although the ride is ending, it's just the start of the adventure.
Bonjour, I'm Keith Rector. I'm the art director for Walt Disney Imagineering for Disneyland Paris and Walt Disney Studios. We're here at Le Pays du Conte de Fée, our storybook attraction, which opened in 1994. This isn't a classic attraction where guests get to ride in a gentle boat ride past classic fairy tale stories. Since this attraction opened, there's been so many new stories. So this was an op opportunity to add a new story to this attraction. Storybook Land is about celebrating iconic Disney architecture. Part of what makes this attraction so magical is taking something that would normally be life-size and shrinking it down to something really small. To, so to see a small little detail like the hose that's, that Carl's holding his house on or seeing the little sign on the Wandering Oak and I think is what makes the attraction magical. So we try to capture all those very small details in each of the scenes, which we hope our guests are gonna pick up on. The thing that I'm most excited about is our new finale for Up. This is a classic fairy tale. It's got an exotic location, it's got a talking dog and a flying house. When I grew up, one of my favorite attractions was the original Storybook Land canal boats in Disneyland in Anaheim. And so it's always been a dream for me to work on that attraction. And so to come here and be able to update and be part of this attraction update was kind of an honor and a career highlight for me. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. It really helps out the channel. And if you want to stay updated with more content like this, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Thanks for your support.